Good morning. So I did it right. Welcome to our worship here at Macon Road Baptist Church. As you make your way in, please pick up a bulletin. There is plenty of information uh, that is very needful for you as you uh, come to worship this morning. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit of that information with you uh, as we begin and as we prepare to pray uh, for our church. Uh, last week, I began to announce that we now have uh, an official box outside for the Memphis Union Mission. Uh, we have been participating over the past several years uh, in helping the homeless, uh, primarily uh, the homeless population downtown, but all throughout Memphis, uh, through the Memphis Union Mission by the collection of certain clothing items that are of a uh, prioritative nature for them. You can see a list in that bulletin, and you'll be able to give uh, toward the, this ministry all throughout the month of December. Uh, but that being said, as I was telling our men this morning, it's amazing how fast these things go, so don't wait. The priority are plain white socks and also, as you see in there, uh, white T-shirts and white underwear. And it has to do with the bleaching, the cleaning uh, of these items. There are other items also if you want to contribute uh, we encourage you to do so. Uh, our Lord puts a high priority on his people being mindful of those less fortunate, of those who are poor. And this is an easy way during the Christmas season for you to remember them. Uh, just when you make your way in, you want to drop off some socks, uh, you can go buy tube socks very uh, easily, very affordably nowadays, some underwear or even some of those other items. The box is labeled. It is outside in the auditorium right when you make your way into our church so you can't miss it. It has a, a sign on it that says Memphis Union Mission. But please be mindful of that. I know that we are in the first week of December, but we will be uh, at the last week of December very quickly. It always goes by quicker than we expect, especially with the Christmas season. So please be mindful of that. That is an easy way for you to participate uh, in ministry in helping those who have the greatest need. Uh, also, I have been pushing and encouraging you, if you haven't done it already, to sign up for our upcoming Christmas dinner that is on December the 13th. Uh, if you have yet to sign up and you'd like to, you've got really about one more week and that's it. Because the 13th will be not this Wednesday but next. And we've got to cut it off by next Sunday so that we can give uh, those catering the meal a head count, those bringing the meal a head count. Uh, a lot of you have asked, well, can I bring this person or that person? You can bring family, friends. We just need to make sure you record or put an accurate head count so we know how much food to have prepared. It is $10 a head. The church is assuming or taking on a, a, a bulk of that cost. If you have children 12 and under, we will pay for them as well. Just please make sure to sign up if you are interested because after next Sunday, that only gives us three days. And we are planning on getting an accurate head count by next Sunday. In other words, we're going to cut it off next Sunday so the following Monday uh, we can let them know. We're asking you to bring that $10 uh, with you that Wednesday evening at the meal. Uh, if you have questions about this, you can see Miss Brandy Leffel. She has been working with them diligently uh, and doing a great job. She will answer any questions you have. Uh, but outside of that, I just wanted to encourage you one last time. You've got a week. That's pretty much what you have. Uh, we'll meet at our normal time. Uh, so nothing's going to change. Six o'clock here, uh, we will have dinner first, so you don't have to rush home for a meal before or after. We will do worship uh, Wednesday evening, same time. So again, if you have any questions, see Miss Brandy, but your time to sign up is fastly coming to an end. Uh, otherwise, I'll let you look at everything else in the bulletin. I was speaking with Brother Joseph. Uh, they are so blessed on Saturday mornings for our men's discipleship group. If you were someone... Uh, as a man who needs to get plugged in, you have uh, a desire to study the Word of God further with other men and grow. Please see Brother Joseph. Brother Joseph, raise your hand if you don't mind. Uh, he would love to hear from you. Uh, they meet. It is such a great atmosphere for the purpose of edification, for fellowship, for discipleship and encouragement uh, in the Scriptures on Saturday mornings. Uh, is 9 o'clock fair to say that's the start? 9 o'clock? I know some of you guys get here a little bit earlier. 9 o'clock, they have coffee, they have donuts, uh, and, and they're here a few hours uh, studying the Word of God book by book, and so I encourage you uh, 
Uh, if you are not plugged in and growing as a man, as the spiritual leader that the Lord has ordained you to be, see Brother Joseph. He would love uh, to hear from you. Let's go ahead and pray, then I'll give you a chance to greet one another and welcome our guest. Father, thank you so much for all that you are doing in our midst. We have more to be thankful for than anyone else on this planet in existence. The bride of Christ has been given the blessings of God in a way that are incomparable to the blessings of everyone else. We have your son, we have assurance, we have forgiveness, we have redemption by his blood. And I pray this morning, Father, that it would be evident by our worship that we know that we are convicted that we have those things in full. Father, grant us understanding this morning as we read your word. Convict us in all areas. Make us more like Christ. Forgive us for your namesake of our sins. Bless us that the desire of our heart, the meditations of our heart, are to be obedient and to bring glory to your name even when we are alone in everything that we do. Bless our giving this season, our giving to our church, our giving to those who are needful of basic items that we are contributing to the Memphis Union Mission. Lord, may we, who have been given the riches of eternity, in return give liberally, for Lord, no one has been given more than us. Thank you for first loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. Greet one another, and then we will reassemble other pa under Pastor Jason's leadership for song.
Good morning. Welcome to Macon Road Baptist Church. As you are able, if you are not already standing, would you stand as we begin our time of singing praise to the Lord? As always, beginning with a reading from God's Word to set our hearts and our minds upon the truth. The beginning of Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. So that is our instruction from Scripture. So let us do that. Come, Christians, join to sing. Hallelujah. Praise to Christ we bring. Hallelujah. Amen. Let all with heart and voice before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Hallelujah. Amen. Come sing of wondrous grace. Hallelujah. Amen. What love that took our place, hallelujah, amen. Christ, he the lamb was slain, bearing our sin and shame, yet triumphed o'er the grave, hallelujah, amen. Come lift your hearts on high, hallelujah, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Hallelujah, amen. Christ is our guide and friend. He shall return again. His love shall never end. Hallelujah, amen. Praise yet to Christ our King. Hallelujah, amen. With all our voices sing, hallelujah, amen. On heaven's blissful shore, his goodness will adore, singing forevermore, hallelujah, amen. Let all with heart and voice be for his throne rejoice, praise. His gracious choice. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, you may have noticed in your bulletin this morning, uh, if you grabbed a bulletin, there's a, a hymn sheet in there. Uh, it's for a song, a hymn we'll sing this morning. Uh, and I didn't know if it would be a little bit of an unfamiliar tune, melody or uh, perhaps even just difficult, even if you think you might know it. Uh, but if you don't have one of those and you think you'd like to have it, either they're in your bulletin, we have some out at the, uh, the little greeting pulpit out there outside the doors too, if you need that. But if not, and you already know it, um, then we'll just sing it out to the Lord. It's, it's a good song to sing as we enter into this Christmas, se Christmas season. Uh, one of the things that we are reminded of in Scripture is from Isaiah 9, chapter 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and then we receive these beautiful names for the Lord. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, that the glories of Christ couldn't simply be reduced to a single name. All of his wonderful attributes have to be named. And so we'll sing this hymn, Join all the glorious names in praise today. Great prophet of my God. 
shed his blood and died. My guilty conscience seeks no sacrifice beside his powerful blood. Did once atone and now it pleads before the stand as we sing our final hymn.
the sea, all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this another day that you've seen fit to give us. Help us, Lord, to seek to live in a way as your children that brings glory and praise unto you for all that you are and all that you do. I thank you, Lord, this morning for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for your long-suffering, for your peace that passeth all understanding, for your faithfulness. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for your great gift. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son, that, Lord, he'd be willing to suffer for each of us as we look to you as our Lord and our Savior. Thank you again for this time of the year as we are reminded of the birth of our Lord and Savior. And I pray, Lord, that as we go through this season of the year, that we'll not allow the things of the world, Lord, to take our minds and our hearts off the real meaning of Christmas. Bless now this part of the worship service that we have the privilege of giving back unto you that which you've blessed us with and continue to work in this ministry. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in the past, what you're doing now, and what you're going to do. I lift my pastor up to you, Lord. Continue to use him. Bless he and his family. Bless, Lord, each member. Thank you again for each visitor that visits within these walls, and we'll give you the praise and glory. I will ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Mrs. Benita and Pastor Jason. 
If you have your Bibles, will you take them now and turn with me to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. And when you find your place, will you join me in standing for the reading of God's word? We are coming to what is certainly a pivotal moment in the life of the early church. The preaching to the Greek pagan nations. We have been in Athens. We are now in Corinth on Paul's second missionary journey. Looking at verse 1, we are told, after these things, those are the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Christ in Athens, the philosophical center of Greek society, he went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. As he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath in trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, we saw that Paul had left them there in a rush for his own well-being. Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. We'll talk about this more in a moment, but he was able to do that and leave by vocational ministry because the church in Philippi sent a large financial contribution by Timothy and by Silas that allowed him to leave off tent making and get into full-time ministry. So he began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. You ever witnessed that way? Why not? It worked for Paul. I'm clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul on the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no man will attack you in order to harm you. For I have many people in this city, and he settled there a year and six months. We normally consider a mission trip to be a week. If you're really faithful, you go for ten days. Paul didn't know anything like that. A year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names in your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat, and they all took hold of Sosthenes, who later, by the way, we are told in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, became a believer. He was the leader of the synagogue and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Galileo was not concerned about any of these things. So Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Centuria he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Our Father, thank you for the example of our forefathers in the faith and how missions work and how the building up of your church took place. I pray that we would obey your command to look at those who went before us who were faithful and imitate their faith as we too obey and serve Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. What are the components of a successful 
ministry? That is a pretty important question, right? What does it mean to have a successful ministry? It's about as important a question as any professing Christian will ever answer. Let me ask it a little bit differently. From start to finish, what does the Bible teach us are the components for a successful ministry to Christ? To be successful in ministry as a mother, as a father, as a son, as a daughter, as a husband, as a wife, as a member of the body of Christ. What does Scripture enunciate? What does Scripture illustrate? as the components that make up a ministry that is successful to Jesus Christ. If you ask that question today, by the way, I fear by the paltry faith that surrounds us and what passes for successful ministry, you would no doubt be given a myriad of unbiblical answers. For example, and many of you know this to be true, for example, ministry... If you ask what is successful, people, a lot of people, look at church buildings. A lot of people, they look at church attendance. They even look at church involvement in the community and their acceptance by outsiders. And they conclude this is a successful ministry. To be growing in numbers, to be in the business of building bigger facilities, To be popular and well accepted in the community are what many, and I dare say most people, consider to be a successful ministry. Those are important components. But would it trouble you to know that not one, not a single one of those descriptions has a single thing to do with what the Bible deems as a successful ministry? Not one of them. None of those components, facilities, numbers, popularity, acceptance, has even a smidgen of a thing to do with what Christ and his followers considered success in ministry. Not one of them. Moses had no buildings apart from a tent. Not one. At times, everyone in his community hated him and oftentimes plotted to leave him. By the way, the New Testament points to Moses as an example of faithfulness and success in ministry. Jeremiah preached 40 years with no facilities and no report of a single convert. And he is an example in the New Testament of successful ministry. No acceptance. He was hated and persecuted for 40 years. Elijah the prophet slept in caves, literally, was constantly on the run for his life, knew very little of acceptance, popularity from the community around him. In John chapter 3, John the Baptist has a ministry that is shrinking. It's shrinking. You can go read it for yourself. He never had a single facility from which to preach inside of. And the outsiders, especially the religious community, hated him. In John chapter 6, we are told that Jesus' ministry is shrinking. Did you know that? Many of his disciples, verse 66, tell us, stopped following him. He had no growing facilities or buildings, and the religious crowd all despised him. The apostles all followed suit, by the way. So what, then, are the components of a successful ministry to God? We can factually establish from Scripture, start to finish, that the successful components in ministry have zero to do with whether a church is growing or shrinking. That that has nothing to do with it. Sometimes God chooses to bless his church and grow it. Sometimes he chooses to bless it and shrink it. In fact, we see in Revelation 2 and 3, for churches to be in good health, Jesus demands they remove people. It has nothing to do with facilities, nothing to do with growing numbers. 
any sort of popularity or acceptance from those on the outside. And by the way, I just named those because when sitting down and studying over this, those seem to be the biggest three. The biggest three factors that most people would qualify, if you gave them a list, what is successful ministry? They'd somewhere fit one of those three in at least. I've often heard it said, if you're building, if you're growing in numbers, you're doing something right. In fact, I know of a pastor right now, this very moment, who literally told his congregations what I call, I call the field of dreams method for church growth. I know the field of dreams. If you build it, they'll come. I know about this because someone called me from that church and said, now wait a minute, I need your counsel, pastor. Where is that in the Bible? And I said, it's not. But we're being told if we put bigger screens up, if we will just spend this money, then eventually people will come in. And let me say something about that, pastor. He may be right. But the people that are coming at that point for those things... Are they even Christians? If we build bigger barns, flashier sanctuaries, it may take time, but people will start to come because here's how it goes. They will want what we have. We have made ourselves enticing. Jesus was despised. Please hear me say this, outward growth is not a definitive component of successful ministry. It may be, but it may not be. We've already seen in Acts that Paul has been chased out of numerous towns without seeing a single convert. We've seen that. In some places, there was hardly any growth at all. Would any of us dare say that Paul was unsuccessful there because of that? Was Jesus unsuccessful in ministry anywhere he went regardless of the crowd crowd size that developed? I don't think Jesus was ever unsuccessful once. This is as important an issue for discipleship in the church as any I've encountered in my 17 years as a pastor. A right understanding of how the Bible identifies successful ministry to Christ. If you don't know or you fail to understand what Scripture considers to be the makeup of successful ministry, then you'll struggle as a Christian to be successful. You can actually make the mistake that the five churches in Revelation 2 and 3 did and be guilty of what the Lord says in Isaiah 5 of calling evil good and good evil, substituting darkness for light, light for darkness. Substituting bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. You could sadly become, as Isaiah warns, wise in your own eyes and clever in your own sight. After all, Kevin, I got people in here. We are far more concerned about the salvation of souls than we are about the bodies and seats. And if not, we don't understand the first factor about a successful ministry and the components that make it up. So what are the, the components of a successful ministry? You see in Acts chapter 18 today, I asked that question because the Apostle Paul has moved on from Athens to a city named Corinth. Look at verse 1. He left Athens, went to Corinth. And Co- Corinth was a tremendously grand Greek city. It is estimated at the time of the Apostle Paul, there could have been as many as half a million people there. Huge. Splendor. It was on an isthmus that stuck out, and so it made it easily accessible to trade by way of ship. It was wealthy. It was grand. It had majesty. And it was as immoral a Greek city as any. It was well known for its temple of Aphrodite. It was a cult prostitute temple in which a thousand cult prostitutes would come down into the city at night and allure into immorality the citizens. Liquor lockers have been dug up there, and to be Corinthianized was a slogan in which someone came to succumb to the immorality of the city. The 
That's what the scripture tells us is the city Paul came to stay a year and a half in. Look at verse 11. He settled there a year and six months doing what? Trying to be popular? Trying to see how he could allure people? He settled there a year and six months doing one thing, teaching the word of God among them. That's all we have. He didn't build a building. We know because of the letters to the church at Corinth there was continual problems. He didn't stay there for just any reason. Scripture records that Christ used Paul to help found the very first church ever established in Corinth. So our passage gives us what is a literal snapshot, a summary, if you will, of 18 months of ministry by the Apostle Paul in a single city. And every Christian alive throughout church history considers this to be a successful ministry of 18 months because it bore fruit of birthing a church. So it's successful ministry. It is a body of Christ with redeemed souls. And Paul did all of this without one record of a facility being built. They used church members' homes. Without any cultural acceptance from outsiders. And with a membership that wasn't always growing, but at times, as we see in 1 Corinthians, was even called upon to remove people and shrink itself due to its continual allowance of outside influences into the church. You can go read that, 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, if you want. He's literally commanding the church to remove people. So Paul bore a successful ministry in Corinth, but the components that made up that ministry look far, far different from what most people today would consider the components for a successful ministry to Christ. And this, this is a dire issue. Christians must understand what makes up successful ministry in the eyes of Christ. If we don't know what successful ministry entails, we'll struggle to serve Christ faithfully. The modern spirit of the age has seduced many churchgoers into believing that successful ministry entails growth. Entails acceptance, entails likability, entails facility, entails popular speakers. And while human growth is sometimes a component of successful ministry, such as seen on Pentecost, sometimes it's not. I have said on numerous occasions, because I've been so impacted by the ministry of George Whitfield, that he had to deal with this during the Great Awakening, and it bothered him tremendously. He would see genuine regeneration and several souls and then other souls would see that regeneration they'd want to be a part of it and before long he realized he was dealing with people that were making religious agreements but were not converted and it caused him great problems and he wrote about it extensively Christians have an obligation to be faithful and understand what does it mean to have a successful ministry And by the successful ministry, I mean in the eyes of Jesus, not yours, not mine. What does Jesus talk about? What do the scriptures portray as success in ministry? I want to take a bit of time this morning. I want to be careful to observe what the components are that are present for 18 months of successful church ministry in Corinth and what it looked like for Paul and his companions. This is obviously and certainly not going to cover, it's not meant to cover all the components for successful ministry, but it's going to cover some vital ones. As previously mentioned, he's arrived in Corinth after his stint in Athens, and while Corinth may not have been the pinnacle of Greek society as Athens, it's not far from it. I mentioned the population estimates, close to half a million people, but there were no churches. So Paul is starting on ground level here. And what does Luke teach us about a year and a half of successful ministry and the components that went into it? Well, there would certainly be many. I want to look at four. We could probably break it down to more. I'm torn here. 
four components of successful ministry to Christ that the Bible says are consistent no matter what time period we find ourselves in history. Let me start with the first one, number one. For Paul, successful ministry involved Christian assistance. Successful ministry involved Christian assistance. Christ has ordained, Christ has determined that success in ministry will be dependent upon assistance from his body. None of us get the luxury of going rogue. This is a clear component that Paul would later teach the very same church he's planting in Corinth. Let me read it to you, 1 Corinthians 12. The body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not the eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now, God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, as he desires. It's not as you desire. Now listen to the consequence of that. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. You have no right to say that to a church member. You're dependent upon that member. The, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. I want you to observe how much this assistance was invaluable during Paul's stay in Corinth. Look at verse 1. After these things, he left Athens, went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila. A native of Pontus, having recently came to Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius commanded all Jews to leave. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. Here is a brother and sister who gave him place to stay. Because of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. There may not have been a church, but God provided other Christians for Paul to have support. That's not all the Christian assistance we see here. Look at verse 5. That's just some of it. We get an entire church's assistance in verse 5. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. If you've read the letter uh, to the church in Philippi, it is a thank you letter. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia at the church of Philippi where they had been left, they brought a tremendously large financial gift to Paul. They had taken up a contribution that allowed Paul to stop tent making, as I mentioned, and devote himself full time to ministry. This is critical Christian assistance in being a component to successful ministry. God has ordained that we would all be dependent upon the body. We read that in 1 Corinthians 12. This is why church membership in devoting oneself to a local body is so critical for any success in following Christ. For Paul, successful ministry included Christian assistance. God has ordained that none of us are meant to be alone. I remember one of the first actions that took place in my life when I came to Christ. I had left the church. Uh, I wasn't a Christian when I left the church. I was told I was. But one of the first convictions that took place was to go back to church. Some of you have been here. You've heard a little bit about this testimony. And I remember going on Sunday. But that wasn't enough for me. I just wanted to be around the saints of God. I wanted them to teach me. I wanted them to help me. I was a new convert. I didn't know anything. And I needed other people who had been doing it. And I remember going back on Wednesday of a church that had 500 people on Sunday and being shocked there were 13 people in there. And I realized that not everybody gets this component of Christian ministry, the need of one another. We're in Hebrews on Wednesday night, and we have not got to chapter 10 yet, but chapter 10 tells us we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some. But we are to gather and exhort one another, and so much the more. Paul had suffered being ran out of town, 
and Philippi, chased out of town. I cannot even imagine what it must have been like to get to Corinth and have two brethren who gave him a place, and then shortly thereafter to have an entire church send money so that he could have support and do the work of ministry. We're not told that there are large numbers that came. That's not a component here. Let me give you another component for successful ministry. If you're going to have a successful ministry, and what I mean by that, in your home, in your work, as a Christian, for Paul, successful ministry involved not only Christian assistance, it also involved clear articulation. You are going to have to be clear about what it means to be a follower of Christ. The people around you that have wrong ideas about what it means to be a Christian need someone to be clear with them. And they're not getting it. What do you mean clear articulation? Look at verse 5. What are we told after they came down from Macedonia? We're told this. Paul was solemnly testifying to the Jews, what? That Jesus was the Christ. He was not there for likability's sakes. You say, well, how do you know? Because everywhere he went, he was chased out of town. He was there to teach them what it meant that Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, Lord and God. And we know how clear he was because we read an entire sermon last time we met in Athens about it. This involved clear wording. Now, I want to warn you, as the Bible does, if you are convicted by this principle, because perhaps you're sitting in here today and you haven't been clear, and you want to be successful in following Jesus. And by the way, Jesus says you need to be clear. You say, well, where does he say that? Well, I think of Matthew 10, 32 for one. Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Confessing him before men entails that you're clear about who he is. You're going to be successful in ministry. It's going to involve clear articulation of the Christ, of the faith, what it means to be a part of a church. You're going to have to be clear with people. Because people don't know. But I want to warn you about this because the scripture warns us. There are two accompaniments to being clear and articulating the faith. Number one, being clear in articulating the faith sometimes brings resistance. Most of you already know this. Look at verse 6. They resisted and blasphemed. I am not going to stand up here and say, look, if you're going to be successful, be clear, and you'll be more winsome. Maybe, maybe not. Success is not defined on how winsome you are. Did you know that? In his day, Jonathan Edwards was probably one of the least winsome guys. You say, well, how do you know? His own church in Connecticut kicked him out. You know what they kicked him out for, by the way? Because he believed only regenerated people should partake in the Lord's table. They removed him. So I don't want to tell you that if you're going to be successful, you need to be clear when you are proclaiming Christ. And everything's going to go great for you if you can get clear on it. It is quite possible the moment you become clear in your articulation of the faith, you're hated more than you're ever hated. That, that's possible. Two accompaniments. Number one, being clear in articulating the faith sometimes brings resistance. Look at verse 6. They resisted and blasphemed. You know what Paul did? He didn't get on his knees and say, Lord, I'm doing everything you asked me to do. I, I, I'm not granting any traction here. What am I doing wrong? He shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. I asked you, and I know a lot of you smiled. It sounded humorous. You ever witnessed a smile like that? I'll tell you what we ought to, by the way, Peter said the same thing to Simon the sorcerer. We were in our men's class. I brought up that point. I said, I appreciate Peter's integrity. You know what he said to Simon the sorcerer? After he told him he was lost and God's judgment was on him and Simon the sorcerer pleaded, you know what he said to him? You need to pray to God that if it's even possible, this will be forgiven you. He didn't even tell him it was possible. Somewhere in articulating clearly what it means to be a Christian, we've got to be honest with people. And we've got to stop confusing what the rest of the church 
around us confuse us that to be honest with them is unloving. The most unloving thing we can do is lull them into some false sense of security that they're born again when you have concerns they're not. But that's not the only accompaniment when you're clear in your articulation. It is true that being clear sometimes brings resistance. But look at verses 7 through 8. Praise Christ, being clear in articulating the faith sometimes leads to repentance. Look at verse 7. He left and he went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God, who was, his house was next to the synagogue. And verse 8 tells us the leader of the synagogue ended up believing in the Lord with all his household. Sometimes, if we're clear with the gospel, Christ is ordained that people are converted through it. When were they repentant? Let's finish that. He believed in his whole household. And with many of the Corinthians, when did that take place? When they heard. How shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10, 14 asks that very question. For Paul, successful ministry involved Christian assistance, but it also involved clear articulation of the gospel. Don't just say to somebody, well, man, I really wish you'd go to church. What? If they're lost, what does that mean? Say, you know what? I, I am burdened. I just want to share the gospel of Christ. If they say, well, I've already been told that. Odds are they have no clue. They have no clue. Most people that just want to swipe me off and say, I've already heard that, when we start getting into the nuts and bolts, no one has ever told them this. Number three, for Paul, successful ministry involved Christ's assurance. You're going to be successful in ministry. You're going to have to understand that you are not alone, no matter how alone you may feel at times. And Christ has already promised you, I am with you. Because there are going to be times you're going to be hated. There are going to be times you're going to be mistreated. And if you don't have the assurance of Christ, you're going to fail. Because it can get really lonely out there. I know. Some of you know. What do we mean Christ's assurance? Look at verse 9. The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision. He comes and he gives him this assurance. And I want to tell you two aspects about this assurance that are critical not just for Paul, but for you. Two aspects. Number one, the assurance of Christ involves his presence. Look at verse 9 again. What did he say? Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking. Do not be silent. Why? Because of verse 10. I am with you. That's great commission language. Everybody see that, right? This assurance that Christ gives us is, number one, of his presence. It's not just the assurance that, hey, go out there and just trust everything's going to work out. I am with you. I don't know what that means to you. That means everything to me. This is great commission language. So if you're sitting here and you say, yeah, but that's Paul. Let me quote the Great Commission to you, Matthew 28, 20. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even till I'm ready to come back, I am with you. If you're going to be successful in ministry, you're going to have to recognize the hand of God in that ministry. And if you don't believe in Christ's assurance being with you, then don't do it. Because you're going to fail miserably. Plead for God to make it evident he's with you. You can't do it alone. I can't do it alone. Paul couldn't do it alone. Why do you think Jesus showed up? To remind him, I am with you. But it's not just his presence. To me, that's enough. To, for Moses, that was enough. You ought to go home and read Exodus 33 when Moses uh, pleaded for God to go with him when God said, look, I'm not going to go amongst you. If I come amongst you after that golden calf, I'll kill everybody. I'll send an angel ahead. And Moses said, If you're not going to go with us, don't take us anywhere. So the presence of God is enough for me. It's enough for Moses. But that's not all the assurance of Christ involves. The assurance of Christ involves, number one, his presence, but it also involves his power. Look at the end of verse 10. It's not just, I am with you. What does he say? No man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. 
I will keep back anybody from doing to you what has already happened in Philippi. I'm in charge of this, Paul. When you show up at Christmas and you're burdened enough to articulate clearly the faith, and you're a pariah, you're not alone. Jesus' own brothers mocked him. By the way, again, this isn't unique to Paul. This is a great commission language. It's not just I'm with you always. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spoke to them. All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. This is the great commission. Go. With all the authority I'm commissioning you, I commission you. You have the authority of God Almighty behind you. See, we don't believe that. We have somehow agreed with the rest of the church at large, and I use that word church loosely, and see ourselves in a paganistic way that we're just some kind of religious movement. We got Jesus at the top, so we can do this thing. You cannot do that thing if Jesus isn't behind you. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I commanded you. That's authority. We don't go and just say, if you only knew how much Jesus loves you and you're breaking his heart, we're going to teach people what Jesus commanded you to do because he's Lord. And if you don't repent, you will perish. You ever said that? Say it. Tell them. Say, Brother Kevin, it's so hard. I know it is, so just do it. Love them enough to do it. I'm going to give you a fourth component of successful ministry here in Cornwall. This is 18 months. A church was planted. It bore fruit. This is successful ministry. It involved Christian assistance. Others had to help. It involved a clear articulation of who Jesus was. Sometimes the church grows. Sometimes that shrinks it. I had a pastor one time, uh, just a faithful expositor, uh, in a local church. I'm not going to use the name. It's here in Memphis. Uh, became need, in need of a pastor. And me and several of our friends were like, man, you should take it. You should take it. They would want you to be pastor. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And we, we all looked up to this guy. We said, why not? He looked at us. He said, because I would split the church. I was young and at that time. I knew very little. But he was saying, I would go in there and I would teach the Bible, and most of them don't want to hear it. And I'm just not ready to get involved in it. Sometimes a church needs to be shrunk before it can be built. You don't believe? Go read what God said to Jeremiah. I didn't call you yet to build. I called you to pluck up, to tear down, to overthrow, then to plant and to build. You can't build on a sandy foundation. Number four. For Paul, successful ministry involved constant attacks or constant accusations. Constant. By the way, this is what Jesus said was a sign of you're doing it right. Blessed are you when men attack you. They revile you. They persecute you. They say all kinds of things falsely about you for my name's sake. We spoke about 1 John 1 this morning. 1 John 3, Apostle John knew about this. Says, Brother, don't be surprised if the world hates you. This is a sign you're born again. For Paul, successful ministry involved constant attacks. Look at verse 12. But while Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord, what did they do? We see this everywhere he goes. They rose up against Paul and they brought him before the judgment seat. Now, there are two realities about these attacks that you're going to have to bear in mind. It was true with Jesus it's often true of the saints. Number one, attacks in ministry are often false. Look at verse 13. What were they saying about him? This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. False. That's not what he was doing. When you're attacked, just recognize most times it'll be false. There's another reality here. Attacks in ministry are obviously, brethren, please, please hear this. Because I don't think most of us believe it. 
they are obviously futile. Who can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? If God is for us, who could be against us? Most of you know this, right? Romans 8. If he who didn't spare his own son but gave him up for, uh, for us, how will he not with him give us all things? It doesn't matter what someone does to you. You live forever. If God ordains even the slaughter of his own son for the good of his people, what can people do to you? How do I know they're futile? Well, this passage points it out. Look at verse 14. They rose up against him with a constant attack, another accusation. Look at how futile it became. If it were a matter, Galileo says, of wrong or vicious crimes, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. If there are questions about words and names in your own law, look after yourselves. I'm unwilling to judge these matters. It's, who cares? There are times God will make it plain. There's nothing they can do to you. He told Paul that. Nobody's going to hurt you here. But brethren, I want to say something to you. Even if they do hurt you, remember what they did to our Lord, and you're in great company. Everything we've seen in this passage this morning, these four components of Paul's ministry there, have hardly anything to do with what most people would tell you are successful ministry. We don't get anything about bigger buildings, anything about more people coming in. There's no acceptance. And yet a church of the living God was planted there. A church that bore fruit in the decades and centuries following. I want you to remember, number four, for Paul's successful ministry involved constant attacks. Jesus promised this one. Let me quote, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. It is the one who endures to the end that will be saved. Maybe now as we leave here, we have just a little bit better understanding of what I asked in the beginning. What constitutes, what is successful ministry? What can we look at in a ministry and say, that is successful? Most people would say if it's growing, well then Joel Osteen's king. Right? Or, or, or whatever charismatic, you name it. They're king. But that's not what constitutes necessarily successful ministry. Are we dependent upon the body of Christ? That's Christian assistance. Are we clear in what we speak in our articulation? Jeremiah was clear and never saw a convert. Not one. The New Testament says he was successful. Are we assured that the Lord is with us? Do we believe that? What is our relationship with the world? Jesus says, the world cannot hate you, but me it hates. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. He told a group of unbelievers, the world can't hate you. To his apostles, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. Let's pray. Our Father, I ask this morning as we close that as feeble, as foolish a sinner as I can be, that there is something that I have spoken today, that I have articulated of your word that has convicted every one of us and how we define, how we look at success and ministry. Lord, we look at your servants, the apostles. We look at those who accompanied them. We look at many of your disciples throughout the centuries. And one of the great overriding components we see is a trail of blood starting with you. Blood that was shed for us on the cross and blood of the brethren that has been spilled throughout the centuries. And it is easy for us to go to those who label themselves at churches and hear homilies preached on Sunday mornings and forget what it truly means to be successful for Christ. 
Lord, where I have not been faithful to your word, I ask that you would forgive me. I ask that the blood of Christ would cleanse me. Success in ministry starts in our very own homes. I ask where I have not been faithful to articulate in the home, you would forgive me, you would cleanse me. As a husband, where I have not been faithful, we're a father, as a pastor, and I pray that everyone in front of me likewise examines their own lives and how we define success as Christians. And that by your spirit, we would be humble enough to recognize our failures, repent, and follow Jesus. I give every one of you the opportunity this morning to follow Jesus. Not simply to believe in him. But salvation involves a faith that compels the believer to follow him. To pursue a life of holiness, obedience, faithfulness, godliness. That is what salvation entails. To do that, you have to be brought to the place by God in which you recognize you are unworthy of anything. It is those, as Jesus preached in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, who recognize their inability to please God. Their spiritual poverty. Blessed are the broken. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they recognize they don't have it. Those are the blessed. If you've come to that place, the answer is Christ. You say, how do you get him? You cry out, Lord, save me. You repent. That means to turn. To change your mind about how righteous you thought you were. How secure you thought you were. And from this day forth, you trust Jesus. And you define successful Christian living by the word of God. You must believe in the lordship of Christ. That death, burial, and resurrection is a reality. And he holds life and death in his hands. Lord, we pray that you would save us to the uttermost. That it would be apparent to all men you were with us. And no matter what it cost us, we would be faithful to the very end. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you all very much. If you're a guest with us, I thank the Lord for your presence with our church this morning. We pray that he blessed you, uh, that he convicted you, that he has led you to further follow Jesus. Please don't forget, because some of you may not be here Wednesday, if you have not signed up for our Christmas dinner that takes place in about 10 days. Uh, your time is closing rapidly. There's sign-up sheets under uh, the information desk out front. All you have to do is sign up yourself and how many you want to come. Uh, you can pay on the day, $10 for adults, 12 and under is free. But please do not miss that opportunity because it's coming to a close. I love you all very much. Let's stand as we close. Pastor Jason, would you close us? Hail the power of Jesus, name. let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown Love can never forget the wood and the gold. Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord of all. Go spread your trophies at his feet and crown him Lord. Terrestrial ball to him.
just be a scribe and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song. join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We close with a scripture of prophecy, looking ahead to the Messiah as we are celebrating this Christmas season. Micah chapter 5, but as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, sorry, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. That is the Savior that we are celebrating at this time of year. May the Lord fill you with the majestic glory of the Son of God. And the Lord bless you this week. We are so thankful to Christ for your participation in the ministries of Macon Road Baptist Church. And we pray that this resource was a blessing to you and your family. For more information regarding our church, please feel free to contact us at MaconRoadBaptistChurch.org.